Today, the Justice Department attained a landmark civil resolution with Citigroup, totaling $7 billion in fines and consumer relief to address the bank's involvement in a scheme to sell fraudulent securities that were backed by toxic loans. Despite the fact that Citigroup learned of serious and widespread defects among the increasingly risky loans that they were securitizing, the bank and its employees concealed these defects. The bank's activities shattered lives and livelihoods throughout the country and also around the world. They contributed mightily to the financial crisis that devastated our economy in 2008. Now, there was a time in America where we actually trusted our banks. We dealt with real people. We knew our cash was being well tended. We even thought those banks were our buddies. Ah, those housing on days when we were all so naive. No longer, as we now have seven billion more reasons to not trust the banks. So what does it all mean to the person who needs those very same banks? That, a public utility idea for companies such as Facebook and the most popular city in America at the moment. Welcome to Midpoint. You read his comments on Busy Blog and PJ Media. Thomas Bloomer checks in today. Tom, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Ed. Tom, here we go. Citibank bags $7 million. Check that, $17 million by the state of Delaware. Again, basically a settlement for not doing things right. I hate to say this, but here we go again. This makes people think we're back at the housing bubble, Citigroup, Citibanks, the same people who are here. Why should Americans have any trust in their banks whatsoever, knowing that it seems they're all dirty dealing somewhere under the table? Well, I, I think the bigger question is why should anybody trust the government, which is regulating the banks and basically causing the kind of behavior that uh, you're describing? And, and let me explain. Um, Citibank allegedly, or let's let's just say they perhaps have admitted to certain practices without like declaring guilt. You know how those legal settlements tend to go. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing exactly what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did by quantum leaps greater, okay? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac took on all kinds of risky loans and uh, deceived the securities markets to the tune of possibly a trillion or more dollars, uh, far more than Citibank or any other private bank ever did, but yet uh, you notice that uh, Eric Holder's not going after Fannie Mae uh, and Freddie Mac for doing uh, the kinds of things uh, that Citibank ended up doing, and I'm going to say Citibank ended up doing it because Freddie uh, Mac and Fannie Mae basically dictated how the market should operate. Uh, and so th these banks ended up figuring out, you know, if we don't start lending money to uh, people who can't afford to pay it back, we're not going to have any loans at all, so let's join the party. Uh, I'm not saying Citibank should have done that, uh, but, the, but I can understand from a human nature standpoint why they would have. Uh, and then going to the next step to deceive investors, well, okay, let's take it on faith that they did. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been shown to have systematically done that uh, to the investment community uh, to the tune of, like I said, at least a trillion dollars. Uh, so to get back to your fundamental question, if we can't trust banks, it's because we can't trust the government that is regulating them to within an inch of their lives and basically telling them everything to do based on lawsuits like the ones Eric Holder uh, has filed and based on uh, the Dodd-Frank law, which was passed uh, roughly, I think, three years ago. Should the headline here, though, not be federal government charges Citigroup, Citibank corporate executives with fraud and looks to put these people in jail instead of what we're seeing right now, and then ask the question why that still has not happened? Well, okay, and, and I get that. Uh, I, I get that concern, but if you're going to start putting people in jail, you need to go to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because the scale of what they did and how they did it is far, far, far greater than anything Citigroup or, and I'm trying to think, J.P. Morgan Chase, I think was another one, uh, did. And again, uh, Citibank and uh, the other banks started doing what they were doing after it was obvious what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were doing. Uh, so. Uh, do I get the idea that, that perhaps some people should be in jail because of this? Yes, but I want a complete cadre that includes uh, executives from uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You won't expect to see that, though, in your lifetime, though, will you? No, I don't. No, I don't, and it's a shame uh, because, like I said, what, what the two so-called government-sponsored entities, enterprises, did 
uh, to ruin the housing market uh, is far, far worse than anything uh, Citigroup or, or uh, any of the other uh, big banks did. But I didn't even get to the point of saying that to be able to take uh, loans from banks, in other words, banks would make the mortgages and then sell them to uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Now, they ended up keeping a lot on their books like uh, City, Citibank and others, but I mean, in the earlier stages, uh, Freddie, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were buying these uh, mortgages, mm -hmm. but what they said is, you know, you can, uh, you really should lend to borrowers who have credit scores of roughly uh, 620. Uh, if those, if your borrowers have credit scores of 620 and above, we're going to consider that a conventional mortgage. Uh, anybody who knows credit scores know that knows that 620 is not an impressive credit score at all. Uh, and they actually lowered the pr threshold for subprime mortgages down to about 580. Uh, and 580 is like barely having a pulse uh, credit-wise. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac basically altered the landscape of the entire mortgage lending market and all of this fallout is a result of what they did in that regard and then even after they got these loans deceiving the securities markets about what kind of loans these were let's talk about item two on the dance card here today a thinking okay. process that google amazon and facebook should be made public utilities and the reason behind this in a number of articles saying that big tech was created with public develop uh, public develop technology so we should move to make them public utilities is this even possible or is this just a, a wonderful pipe dream here to try and so, bring these companies I mean, into some sort of customer service <laughs> well you, you you'd like to think that it's a pipe dream uh, but you'd also like to think we wouldn't have two politicians as prominent as President Obama and Senator Elizabeth Warren basically saying, you didn't build that. Uh, so uh, what the author of the Salon article that you're referring to, who wants to nationalize Amazon, Google, and Facebook, by the way, uh, is basically saying that they're taking advantage of the Internet, which the government built. Therefore, uh, it's perfectly within the government's uh, realm to uh, nationalize them if they don't, uh, according to his definition, behave. Uh, now, I'm not going to deny that uh, each of the three companies have a fair degree of power right now. Google controls like 80% of search, but nobody's forcing Google to use, uh, or nobody's forcing people to use Google as their search engine. Uh, Amazon obviously dominates online sales of all kinds of things. Uh, but again, nobody's forcing you to use Amazon. Uh, and third, Facebook obviously dominates social media, but nobody's forcing you to use Facebook. Now, the argument is, well, shoot, I can't, I can't build my business unless I, you know, uh, advertise myself on Facebook, or I can't build my personal brand unless I uh, build myself on Facebook. Well, a, you don't have to, and uh, and b, there's other ways uh, to build your brand. Uh, now, all of these companies have their problems. Amazon's been behaving rather aggressively and anti-competitively. Google has had its moments along those lines. And Facebook, uh, you know, is arguably uh, invading people's privacy to an extent that is possibly illegal. But if those companies are doing illegal things, the Justice Department should stop doing silly things like going after somebody in Nebraska for an Obama uh, making fun <laughs> of latrine or whatever it was and start looking at real violations of the law if there are any that these companies are committing and if they're not well then we should leave them alone about a minute I have left here how do you like Cleveland Ohio uh, well, Cleveland's profile has improved a lot in the past uh, five or six days, hasn't it? It sure has. Uh, All of a sudden, they have, a, they have a big sports star back home now. The Republican National Convention is getting yeah. there. Hey, come on. It's the most popular city in America right now. Well, <laughs> you know, there's only one problem with that theory. Uh, I mean, look, I'm in Ohio. Uh, a lot of people down here in Cincinnati, which is where we're from, like to make fun of Cleveland, and it's an easy target. Uh, I personally want Cleveland to succeed. Uh, Cleveland has failed largely because of left-induced policies that go back a good 50 or 60 years when, frankly, everybody in Cleveland thought they were untouchable as one of the greatest cities in the nation. There was a point in time, I think, when Cleveland was the fifth or sixth largest city in the country 
with like 900,000 people. Right now the city has something in the neighborhood of 400,000 people. Their uh, population bleed is, I believe it's only second to Detroit's. So, uh, you know, it's very nice that Cleveland has these uh, new developments, but they need them. Uh, and I'd like to think that there's maybe a bit of a change of a philosophy up there, but I'm worried that that's not the case because, frankly, Cleveland is still uh, controlled by by the left. And in terms of one of the two major developments, the Ten Republican, seconds. in terms of uh, the uh, Republican National Convention, frankly, I'm worried that um, we're, that they're going to underestimate how much uh, of leftist fever swamp activity goes on down there. All right, we got to go all out of time. Thomas Bloomer, thanks for joining us, and Midpoint continues.